Hey guys, we are at the Museum of Vanning in South Florida and check it out. We're going to get a tour. We're going to look at some vans here that are basically historic type vans. We're talking to Joe, who is the curator, curator and uh, of this and it's nonprofit. And listen, guys, it's almost the end of the year. You have too much money. Takes you all got COVID money. You all did other stuff with the stock market and all that stuff. So what you need to do is go onto their website, donate a couple bucks, ten bucks, twenty bucks, thirty bucks, whatever. If you have a van, if you have vanish things, if you have a Hot Wheels van, if you have things that you could donate that are not cash but are vanish, reach out, send an email. Um, you'll see right below me, right here, right there. That's the, the website right here. So you'll see that. Send, go to that website, check it out, reach out to them. Vegetable City Vans. I just got the headlights and the rings and everything donated for that uh, just recently, so I gotta get the lights and a little more done to it. And then here's another hood. That's the original hood off my uh, Panic in Detroit. Um, oh, okay. When that hood started to crack, I wanted to fix it. And I thought we all we were going to do was get in there and repair the Vondo in it. And um, uh, my buddy Matchstick said, well, let's just build you a whole new hood because if we're going to stamp louvers in it, it's going to be easier to do it with it apart. So I just took the hood off when we started fresh and uh, decided to keep it. Now, I recognize this, but I don't see a van it fits on. It actually just left here about three days ago. That okay. was my 94. Um, okay. I just sold it. Um, my wife enjoyed the, the mural on it so much she said there's, it's not leaving. You're either keeping the truck or taking the hood off. So I went to the junkyard and bought another hood and swapped it out and uh, so we got to keep the mural. The fellow that hand painted that has passed away from Kentucky. Gary Wills was his name and so we just wanted to keep it. Oh. And then these. Now these vans up here were this were fronts from just vans that were so far gone you couldn't really do anything with them. I, honestly, I don't know the history behind them because when I got them, that's what they, I got them just the way they sit. Oh, I didn't okay. Cut these up. Um, okay. I found this van over over in Daytona Beach, uh, just laying at at the swap meet over there and a Turkey Run. I found that on Marketplace, the Chevrolet, and the Dodge came from a fellow named Brian Bowie up in. Annapolis, Maryland, who runs a thing called the A100 Van Association. Okay. It's a whole society dedicated to that first generation Dodge van, the A100s. Oh, okay. So that would be an A100 then. Correct. Okay. Yep. That All was right. his little sign he used to put up and he had this group. So welcome to another episode of Junkyards and Barn Finds with Sean and I'm Sean. <laughs> All right, so now we're going to go into the museum. You guys have seen the vehicles that are outside, the, some displays. We're going and by the way, there's more here, but I'm not showing them that because you have to come here. You need to come. If you're anywhere near Tampa, if you're anywhere near I-75, listen, you're driving down, you're going to Disney World, stop here first, call them up, say, hey, we'd like to stop for 20 minutes. You can sit, go up to 19 or whatever, real close. There's a whole bunch of restaurants. You go to the restaurants, feed the family, come over here, check this out, make a donation, then head to Disney World. But while we're doing that, you're gonna come in here, and the first thing you're gonna see is a gift shop. And there is a pretty nice little gift shop here. And they have cool things. If you're a van guy, even like the cards, you can you can get stuff to mail. I don't know if they have the 60 cent stamp, but buy a forever stamp. So whenever you get here, you know you can do it. For all you van people that want to come here or people who collect patches, they got patches, they got all kinds of stuff in here. Um, they've got van cars, they've got van memorabilia, they got van magazines, they got everything here, including t-shirts and hats. And you guys, the first thing you do, you're going to come in here, you're going to walk through this, pick out what you want. You're going to leave your kids here so they can grab all kinds of stuff, put it in a bag. And then you will uh, put a donation in here. You're going to sign the guest book. And then you're going to get a guided tour like we are through the museum. So that's what we're doing right now. So uh, when we come back, and then when you come back out, all the kids will have their hands full of stuff and toys like they do at every other store. You'll pay for that and you'll say thank you and leave. The so first, first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna quit using the term cars. 
you may find a car or two in here, um, maybe in a Hot Wheels, but you're not going to see many of it. From now on, it's going to be strictly vans. Not even trucks, for that matter. We're just going to keep saying vans. The love here is vans. So Okay. Okay? Now, um, so to get us started... What we're trying to do here at the Museum of Vanning is, uh, is give you a history of, uh, of our sport. Our sport basically started in 1961 in Southern California. Um, our vans were created. Our first American van was this Econoline, which was built in 1961. Uh, these were vans that those soldiers that were coming home from overseas could find the old plumber's trucks and the old uh, electrician vans and stuff they could find for five or six hundred dollars. They were dropping V8s in these vans and they were putting mag wheels on them and doing all that cool stuff that uh, the hot rodders and stuff they were doing to their cars before they went to Europe. Remember, these uh, Vietnam veterans were not treated the best when they came home, so they were rebelling against everything there was to be had. Mickey Mouse, uh, Rat Pink was the anti-Mickey Mouse in this world. And the van was a way for them to, to, be, uh, to show an individualism of who they were. They could paint these wild murals on the side. They could sleep in their vans. They could put their surfboards in it and hang out at the beach. And then they could be who they were. As the millions of vans that have been built over the years, there's never really been two alike. So we're trying to tell you that history. And of course, that history of those kids in Southern California um, started to get together. And before you knew it, there were some clubs. And they all said, well, hey, let's get together and go out to the desert and ride our motorcycles and start camping out. And then all of a sudden, we had van events that were happening. So it's all about evolution with our, with our sport. Uh, the van came in 61. It's like, well, which came first, the chicken or the egg? Well, the van definitely came first. And so these guys were really into these old trucks. And for more than 50 years now, we've, we've made an impression on everybody in this country. And the media was a, the biggest point that we had. Once the media caught hold of these kids having fun in these vans, um, they started having pictures and then our, our, uh, our sport grew. It definitely started in Southern California and worked its way across the United States. It's hard to imagine these long haired kids that were partying uh, their days away in their vans would make an in, such an influence, but they even influenced uh, Ford, Chevy, and Chrysler with uh, the vans that were coming out of the factories even. Uh, the Dodge Street van and the Ford Cruising van, these were all vans that the largest manufacturers in the country were starting to produce. So people were noticing us. We were having uh, van events that were drawing thousands and thousands of people. In 1976 and 75, we were showing more than 30,000 people were attending at these events uh, with, with almost 7,000 vans in attendance. So we've, uh, we've continued to grow over those years. We took a little slowdown in the middle 80s with the gas price and a lot of our kids that were growing up and starting families. But we never really went anywhere. Um, we didn't have the media coverage back uh, in that time, but we sort of stayed together in our own little networking. And now with uh, the internet and Facebook and everything, we're still able to stay together and um, let each other know that we're traveling and where we're going. This section of the museum is our memorabilia uh, area. This is where those clubs that have all their jackets, we have over 70 jackets on display from all over the world. We have memorabilia here from 17 different countries around the world, including Canada, the United States, and every state. These jackets were our way of uh, showing the, the rest of the world that we were into bands in our clubs. And the patches that are on these jackets are the events that we used to go to. We have over 45,000 dash plaques in the museum, more than 1,000 hat pins, 3,000 3, plus patches, plus all these jackets. Wow. The display cases that are in this part of the, uh, this part of the museum are uh, our original fundraisers. These cases were bought uh, by clubs and individuals and councils to help us with our initial fundraising. Because we are a nonprofit and rely on our donations, um, these, are, uh, these sales of these cabinets are what help make possible for us to buy the nails and screws and plywood and paint that it took to get the building started. Wow. Check it out. I love these. I mean, I like the pictures too. Everything is 
from all over the place. Yeah, we've asked them. One of the things I really like in the museum is the interaction that we've asked from people. We have uh, some pictures here in the middle of the, of the, uh, the building that run all the way around. We call that our ring of honor. And what that is, is those are individuals that have given us pictures of their bands and with them too, in some instances, where um, they uh, can be a part of the museum. This uh, ring goes all the way around the museum. We've got nearly 200 of them now. And for a $25 donation, you can have your picture up in the museum. Nice. We have toys from all over the world. Um, the display here is just our original 61 uh, the 67 Econ line, that first generation van. In this area, we have a lot of ceramic cookie jars and lunch boxes and coffee mugs and banks and uh, all those little things, again, that we influenced all these different companies to produce. You'd be hard pressed to find a superhero, a cartoon character, or just about anybody that didn't want to see their name on the side of the van. Remember, those vans are those huge rolling billboards that went down the highway. And first thing you see when a plumber drives by is his phone number and one foot letters going down the side. Vanner saw that too. And by painting all these wild custom colors and stuff on their vans, they were guaranteed to be noticed. Wow. One of the most famous vans that we all know. Scooby-Doo. Scooby-Doo. Yep. <laughs> if you look over here, um, I have a, a very dear friend, his name was Dale Tusk. Um, Dale passed away a couple of years ago, and Dale knew my collection as well as I did or better. And he knew the one uh, Scooby-Doo cookie jar I did not have in the collection. When Dale passed away, he made sure that his ashes were put in that cookie jar, and Dale is with us all the time now. Dale was a very big uh, contributor and worker here at the museum in its initial startup, and so now he's with us uh, all the time wow. here at the museum. Wow. So, Going that way. Going this way. Yep. All right. Make a left turn. Going left. The back of a van. The Royal Coach. This is the Royal Coach. This is a 1974 Ford Econ line. I started building this van in 1975. You built this. I built this. Okay. Again, I did everything but paint the murals on this. This is all airbrush work. Um, the mural depiction on, these, on this van is uh, by an artist named Frank Frazetta. Uh, Frazetta was very famous back in the 50s and 60s for doing movie TV posters. Um, he also uh, sort of got the whole uh, Conan the Barbarian look rolling with, uh, with the movies when the, that Arnold Schwarzenegger was in. And uh, his artwork was copied a lot back in the 70s. Um, a lot of vanners really loved the look. so. Um, even artists to this day that are doing airbrush work um, are into that Frazetta style look. And that was a 74 Ford van. Correct. So This van started, I started building this van in 75. You see the, the uh, signature on the side. Uh, White Wolf was the original painter back in Detroit, Michigan, 1978, and the murals went on this truck. This depicts the 70s more than just about anything. There's a vinyl top on this van. Again, more crushed velvet. Uh, there's mirrors in the ceiling. The eight-track player and tapes are still in the inside. And sunroof. Sunroof. CB roof, antenna. CB 23 channel CB. The luggage rack on the roof. The gull wing doors. All the flares are molded on this truck. So uh, get the, the taillights in this one. Okay. So can you guess what those lights are? Uh, I would say 71 to 73 mu uh, Mustang. That's it. That's it. Turn sideways. The body work in this truck was also done by a fellow um, in Detroit, Michigan, who was a car customizer back in the 50s. So all of the body work in this van is actually done in lead. You know what the term lead sled means yep. or where it came from. Well, before the Bondo and fiberglass was uh, highly used, um, the car companies and car guys use, use lead. So um, the French antennas, the taillights and all that in this truck were all done in, in that process. Yeah, my, I had a 57, the very, if you guys watch my channel, the very, very first one, uh, the very first video is me on my 57 back in 1986, trying to redo all the lead bodywork that was done wrong on one of the fins because the fin was like this. Oh, <laughs> 
And I love the sunroof, old turn. And now this, the the um, Visor. visors, mm -hmm. were they were they they never came stock on a van, right? No, they did. So uh, all of that is aftermarket. The hood again on this truck, the scoop, the flares on the wheels, the visor, the going door on the back. These were all aftermarket parts that van shops started to produce for vans again back in the very early 70s that's what i was going to ask you was was any of this stuff when you built this van was the stuff off the shelf or it pretty much was all had to be made right no, at that time uh, or? back in the and again back in that time um there were a lot of van shops around and i grew up in the detroit area but these shops were all over the country um, these were parts that were manufactured um, generally in california by companies that were uh, they started on dodge vans um, those were generally the, where everything was molded off of first, and then the Fords and the Chevrolets came along. But uh, these van shops would, uh, would just carry all these manufacturers' lines. One of the stories that's tacked in the museum, which we'll see at a later time, um, a fellow named uh, Ken Zuko, who ran a shop in Chicago called Mr. Van, he actually ran a speed shop there. And you know what the SEMA show is. Right. Um, well, back in the day, the SEMA show used to be in... Los Angeles, not in Vegas like the big production is now. And those guys would get together and they would talk about all the new parts and all the things that were cool for cars that they would put in their in their speed shops. So this is the Notel Motel. Uh, this is a 67 Dodge van. This was the very first van that was donated, a uh, full-size van that was donated to the museum by a fellow named Brian Bowie. I told you about him a little while ago. Um, Brian had the patent on a lot of uh, uh, innovations on these vans, the V8 motor mounts and uh, the Nerf bumpers, uh, windshield rubber, and made uh, those parts accessible for guys that were restoring these vans. So uh, this van is in eight doors. You can see there are doors on the passenger side of the van, which is not totally uncommon, but it is kind of rare. Um, the van also has a 225 slant six in it, three speed down the tree. And the interior is pretty basic uh, when it comes to 70s van. He's got a bed on the floor. He decorated it with uh, shag carpet and uh, record albums on the walls. Again, there's an 8-track player in the dash and all his dash plaques in the front. So, Brian used to love to uh, travel in his van as a lot of guys did and he wanted his van to be comfortable and kind of sharp looking uh, at the same time. The wheels for this van were donated to us about four years ago from a fellow in Michigan. Mickey Thompson tires with American racing wheels that were period correct and bolted right on the truck. They were actually on a 57 Ford Fairlane that he'd put on that car in 1970. He just took them off the car like five years ago. The heaviest, largest and heaviest dash plaque in vanning history. Is that that? That's the granite piece down at the bottom. Oh, wow. Yeah. It weighs over 300 pounds. <laughs> that piece of granite has been in two countries, three different states and probably five different households, and it's even moved three times here at the museum. Wow. I guess they didn't give that to everybody who paid to get it. You want the story? <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> the story of this dash plaque is uh, my buddy right here, Ron Duguay, is in this picture. He's 25 years old in that picture. This is around 1975. Um, Ron uh, comes to our uh, annual event every year, lives here in Florida. And uh, the dash plaque is basically a souvenir that you get when you go to a, a car show. It's a two by three or three by three piece of tin uh, imprinted with the event name on it as your souvenir. Well, being from Canada, he went to an event in New York. And when he got there, first thing you do when you get to an event is open up that goodie bag and tear through it to try to find your dash plaque. Well, he didn't get one. And his friend was uh, the guy that ran the, uh, the, the, uh, the show there in New York. And he gave him holy heck about it. He says, you know, I come all the way from Canada and the first thing I expect, and of course it was all in good fun. And uh, he never did get his dash plaque. Well, a year went by, Ron went back to the event a year later and uh, walked away from his van and uh, came back a little bit later, opened the side doors and found this 350 pound piece of granite in his, <laughs> in his van. Basically his friend walked up and said, here's your effing dash plaque. <laughs> um, the dash plaque is engraved uh, with his name, the Happy Pollock, which was his buddy from New York. And uh, so there is a, a great history to it. It is a Guinness Book of World Record, heaviest dash plaque ever made. <laughs> uh, Ron donated it to us a few years back and then just donated the signage and made up the display board for it uh, just last year when he came for our party. 
Oh, so wow. It may not be in our, at the last place it's going to be in either, but the last place I had it in the museum, I tripped over it six times. <laughs> so I had to move it. So here's some more of, of, of these. So this, this whole display is dedicated to the National Truck Inn. This okay. is the Van Nationals, our granddaddy event of the year. This event in 1973 was, was started by Hot Rod Magazine and Rocky Mountain Vans as a way of uh, bringing people, banners from all over the United States together. And it's, that's what this, when we see this logo in here, that's correct. what it that is, is, right? That is the memorial patch, the, uh, the okay. patch from the event, yes. The um, original concept of the trucking was that it would move around the country and make it easier for people from the East Coast to the West Coast to get to this event. Our country being so large, it would be hard sometimes to travel. So they decided that it was going to be in the middle of the country. Believe it or not, the crossroads in the United States is Colorado. And so when they did the very first truck in, it was held in Tiger Run, Colorado in 1973. It continued to move its way east after that for a few years. Um, we actually are going back this year or 2023 for our 50th anniversary. We're going back to Colorado in July of 2023. Wow. So it's been in Colorado a few times. It's been in Ohio the most. We found that found out that uh, like Deanna Saray figured out that even though Colorado was the middle of the country, most of the people live east of the Mississippi. So by having that event move around the country, it really wasn't good for numbers, but it is something that we have stuck to in our tradition. Where the NSRA decided to have it in Louisville for the next 200 years, we still are doing that traveling concept, even though we have uh, limited the number of cities that we are moving it to. 